think the reason why it's so challenging to say something important about uh, economic inequality is because we all know a lot about it. We all lived through the 2016 election uh, where there were a lot of people who were upset about economic inequality. Both Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump relied on economically populist rhetoric and got a lot of support for it. We've all seen data about the increasing wealth going to the 1% in America, uh, most famously described uh, in Thomas Piketty's book, Capital in the 21st Century. We've also all heard about the shrinking middle class, the fears that your kids' generation will not be uh, as well off as yours was, uh, and the idea that mobility is getting harder and harder. But I don't want to talk about these economic questions or even the policy questions. What I want to ask is a different question. Is economic inequality a constitutional problem? Hi everyone, thank you all for, for coming today. Thanks for that introduction. It's terrific to, to be here in Cambridge uh, and particularly here in Harvard Square at the Harvard Bookstore. Uh, in some ways, this book actually was born here uh, and I mean that in two senses. Uh, first, uh, we're here in Cambridge, uh, one of the birthplaces of this country, of the revolution, just down the road. Uh, as many of you I'm sure know, George Washington took command of the uh, revolutionary forces for the first time, right over by Cambridge Common. Uh, and pretty much every street name here or anything else has something to do with the very fabric of this country. You'll see Adamses and Quincy's and, and so on around. So it, it, in a way, this book is deeply tied to this area. Uh, it's also, um, in a way born here because I started in some ways coming up with this when I was here. Uh, I was here at Harvard as, a, as an undergraduate and studied political theory uh, and history. Uh, I was here in law school where I studied constitutional law and constitutional theory. Uh, and when I was here also as a, as a fellow at one stage uh, uh, is when the big economic crash happened uh, and I started thinking uh, about economic power, economic inequality, uh, and its relationship to our constitutional system uh, more rigorously after, after that uh, giant event. Um, so it's terrific for me to be here. Uh, I, I suspect some of you may though have been um, a little skeptical about coming today. Uh, because what more could possibly be said about economic inequality and the, the shrinking middle class? Everybody has been talking about this for years. Uh, economists, moral philosophers, policy makers. Uh, and then I show up and you see me looking 12 years old claiming to say something new <laughs> about this topic. Uh, well, this is Harvard where 20 year olds start billion dollar companies. So I'm going to try to say something uh, new about a big topic as well. Um, I think the reason why it's so challenging to say something important about uh, economic inequality is because we all know a lot about it. We all lived through the 2016 election uh, where there were a lot of people who were upset about economic inequality. Both Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump relied on economically populist rhetoric and got a lot of support for it. We've all seen data about the increasing wealth going to the 1% in America, uh, most famously described uh, in Thomas Piketty's book, Capital in the 21st Century. We've also all heard about the shrinking middle class, the fears that your kids' generation will not be uh, as well off as yours was, uh, and the idea that mobility is getting harder and harder. But I don't want to talk about these economic questions or even the policy questions. What I want to ask is a different question. Is economic inequality a constitutional problem? Now that should probably make you skeptical too. After all, the Constitution doesn't say anything about the middle class per se. It's not referenced anywhere in the text. It doesn't say anything about economic equality or inequality either in the text of the Constitution. If anything, these days the Constitution seems to work against economic equality. Citizens United, the Supreme Court decision about the First Amendment, for example, allows the wealthy and corporations to disproportionately influence policy and politics more than everyone else. This seems to cut against doing something about economic equality. But I think this is a constitutional problem. Uh, and let me explain why. For most of the history of Western political thought, from the ancient Greeks to the 18th century, constitutional theorists were deeply worried about the problem of economic inequality. They worried that if a society was divided into rich and poor, either the rich would oppress the poor, or the poor would try to confiscate the wealth of the rich. And the result would be violence, strife, and revolution. Now the founders knew this history. They were deeply steeped in history. And they were well aware that economic inequality was a real problem and a serious source of strife. 
So they worried that if the wealthy uh, took over the government, they would pass laws to help themselves, stacking the deck in their favor. John Taylor uh, of Caroline, he was a Virginian, uh, he had said in 1814 that when the rich plunder the poor, it is slow and legal. The people, increasingly angry at rising economic and political inequality, would respond, but not through some sort of anarchist uprising. They would respond by finding a leader who would try to overthrow the oligarchy. Uh, you may have heard of um, a, a future Broadway star named Alexander Hamilton. Uh, he was known uh, in those days for, not for his singing ability, but for, uh, for writing. Uh, and in the very first of the Federalist Papers, uh, he, he wrote that of those men who have overturned the liberties of republics, the greatest number have begun their career by paying an obsequious court to the people, commencing demagogues and ending tyrants. So oligarchy and tyranny. These were the fates for an unequal republic. Now, statesmen and thinkers came up with two solutions to this problem. The first solution was to incorporate economic class right into, into the structure of government. So in England, you've got a House of Lords, the rich. You've got a House of Commons for everybody else. In ancient Rome, there's a patrician senate for the wealthy. There's a tribune of the plebs for the poor. I call these class warfare constitutions because they build class conflict right into the structure of government. Each class has a share in government, but each class also has a check on the other side. And what that means is there can be stability between the two classes. Now the second solution was first articulated by Aristotle. And Aristotle said that the best government is a government in which the middle class would be bigger than either the rich or the poor and in which the middle class therefore governed. And he called this a middle constitution. I call it a middle class constitution, that's hence the title of the book. Uh, and this solution is something of a cheat. And it's a cheat because if there isn't economic inequality, and that's the basic idea, you have a big middle class, not that many rich people or poor people, you don't really have that much economic inequality, uh, then you don't actually need any of these structures. You don't need a tribune of the plebs, you don't need a house of lords when you have a system of economic equality. So when we get to the founding, they look back at this uh, tradition, they're aware of these ideas, uh, and they then look around at their own conditions, and they believe that they are uniquely equal in the history of the world. And I think, you must all think that's a nuts thing to say, just crazy thing to say, how could that possibly be? Um, but if you think about it, it sort of makes sense. Uh, in the late 18th century, America is sparsely populated. There's some small towns, Cambridge, Boston, uh, but nothing like London, nothing like Paris. The center of the world is, is Western Europe from their perspective. They live on the way fringes of, of the universe. Um, and when they look across to Europe, they see how different they are. Unlike Europe, there's no feudalism in America. Unlike Europe, there's no hereditary aristocracy. The richest people in America, people like George Washington, very wealthy, successful planter, are nothing to compare, can't compare at all to the dukes and duchesses of England and France who live in gigantic marble palaces. No comparison. The other big difference is that America has vast lands available to the West, which means that any white man, it's only white men at the time, we'll talk more about that, uh, could become a property owner. And most wealth is, is property at the time, and so they see this as an opportunity for economic equality. And I'll just read you a, a couple of brief accounts. Um, uh, Noah Webster, who you may have heard of uh, from the dictionary, he created Webster's Dictionary, uh, lived in this time period. And, and he says, uh, an equality of property is the very soul of a republic. While this continues, the people will inevitably possess both power and freedom. When this is lost, power departs, liberty expires, and a commonwealth will inevitably assume some other form. Charles Pinckney, who was a delegate to the Constitutional Convention in the summer of 1787 in Philadelphia, uh, he, during the convention, here, here's what he said. He said that America was not only very different from the inhabitants of any state we are acquainted with in the modern world, but also distinct from either the people of Greece or Rome or of any state we are acquainted with among the ancients. 
He said that America had a greater equality than is to be found among the people of any other country and that equality would continue because the new nation possessed immense tracts of uncultivated lands which would ensure there will be few poor and few dependent. So what I think you see here is a widespread belief. I haven't given you the full sources, but you can read them in the book. Um, but there's a widespread belief that economic equality is necessary to have a republic and also that Americans were relatively equal. There's also some reason to think that this wasn't just a belief that the founders had, that it might have actually been right. Uh, there's two economic historians, Peter Lindert at Berkeley, Jeff Williamson here at Harvard, who've done pretty extensive work trying to get uh, a measure of economic uh, equality from the founding period, and it's hard to do uh, because of the, the sources. Uh, but what they've, what they've pulled together and found is that in 1774, right on the cusp of the American Revolution, the top 1% in America took home 8.5% of national income. Now, I'll just put that in, in, in some terms. That's about the same as it was in 1976, a little bit less, actually. Um, that's a number that includes slavery for 1774. In comparison to today, today the top 1% takes home more than 20% of national income. So more than twice as much goes to the top 1% in America today than it did in 1774. They conclude at the time in the late 18th century that America had the most egalitarian distribution of wealth of any place on the world that one could measure. So with relative equality as the backdrop, when the founding generation adopts the Constitution, they don't make it a class warfare Constitution. We don't have a tribune of the plebs. We don't have property qualifications for senators or for the president or for members of the House of Representatives or for the cabinet or for the Supreme Court. Uh, the framers knew how to write these provisions. They, in fact, debated provisions exactly like them. Many of the state constitutions, including the state constitution, Massachusetts Constitution of 1780, written by John Adams, uh, had property qualifications built into it. So these were alive and well at the time. And yet, they rejected them in our federal constitution. This is a radical change. This is a major change. It's a big difference between our system and the other constitutions at the time. So what I argue is that we have a middle class constitution, a constitution that's based on the assumption that America had and would continue to have relative economic equality. Now, over the course of the 19th century, everything changed. Industrialization, urbanization, the closing of the frontier, the shift from artisanal and agricultural work to wage work in factories. These developments all put extreme pressure on the economic foundations of our constitutional system. During the Gilded Age in the late 19th century, economic inequality was on the rise, and it was leading to an increased concentration of power, people believed, in a small number of robber barons and plutocrats. And so progressives and populists at the time thought this was a threat to the republic, a threat to our constitutional system. Teddy Roosevelt said there can be no real political democracy unless there is something approaching an economic democracy. And I'm going to just read you a passage from the book to give you a feel, uh, both a little bit of a feel for the book and a feel of the, the situation uh, in the late 19th century. So this is uh, 1880s and 1890s, to give you a sense of the, the corruption. Marcus Daly was determined to stop William Andrews Clark. Clark, like Daly, was an industrial magnate who owned copper mines, mills, smelters, lumber, banks, retail stores, newspapers, and utilities. But what Clark really wanted was to win elected office in Montana. Partly he wanted the status and power that came with public leadership. Partly he wanted to support policies that would improve his business holdings and harm those of Daly. When Clark stood for Congress in 1888, Daly men pasted their hand-picked candidate's name over Clark's on ballots leading to Clark's loss in an instant of spectacular fraud. And so began Montana's War of the Copper Kings. Over the next two decades, copper magnates in Montana would engage in some of the most blatant, surprising, and shocking efforts at corruption to gain political power in American history. Daly canceled business contracts with those who would not support his political aims. He started his own newspaper to compete with Clark's. The two fought over whether the state capital would be located at Anaconda, Daly's company town, or Helena, which Clark supported to block Daly. They gave away cigars, bought rounds of drinks, and sometimes just handed out money in an effort to garner support for one city or the other. 
Clark decided in 1890, that 1899 was his last best chance to get into the Senate, and he was willing to pay legislators whatever it cost. The opening bid for a bribe was $10,000 a vote, with many reportedly coming in at $20,000 and one rumor of $50,000 for a single vote. Clark's son remarked that they would send the old man to the Senate or to the poorhouse. For his part, Clark said he never bought a man who wasn't for sale. <laughs> By some estimates, Clark spent $431,000 to buy 47 votes in the state legislature and offered more than $200,000 that was rebuffed. Commenting on the brazen corruption in the election, Mark Twain said of Clark, he is said to have bought legislatures and judges as other men buy food and raiment. By his example, he has so excused and so sweetened corruption that in Montana, it no longer has an offensive smell. Senator William Clark took office in Washington, only to have investigations open immediately. After hearing testimony from state legislators and even Montana Supreme Court justices whom Clark's agents attempted to bribe, the Senate Investigations Committee declared Clark's election void. In an amazing maneuver, Clark resigned, and his allies in Montana contrived to get the governor out of the state, making the lieutenant governor, a Clark ally, the acting governor, at which point the lieutenant governor appointed Clark to fill the now vacant Senate seat that Clark had just been denied. So that gives you just a sense of the kind of corruption that was going on at the time period. Bribery of state legislative officials uh, at the time the Senate was still chosen by state legislatures, uh, and these kind of machinations to get someone into the Senate who uh, wasn't supposed to be there. And so in response to this, populists and progressives acted, and they came up with some of the most creative solutions to address the problems of economic and political power. On the economic side, they invented antitrust law to break up concentrations of corporate power. <coughs> they passed a constitutional amendment to allow for income taxes so that people who had a greater ability to pay could pay more. In order to prevent economic power from unduly influencing politics, they passed the first real campaign finance laws. And they also passed a constitutional amendment for the direct election of senators. In addition to in their states creating things like initiatives and referenda, again, to bring power back to the people. Now these battles were fierce in the progressive era and they continued through the New Deal. But after World War II, the idea that economic inequality was a threat to the republic, a threat to our constitutional system, started to wane. And it really disappeared from our national consciousness in this period. And I think this happened for three reasons. The first is that the New Dealers really won the big constitutional battles. After the New Deal, there was no longer any debate that the federal government couldn't make policy over economic issues. The debate moved from the constitutional realm into just regulatory policy, questions about what's good policy. The second big change was the Cold War. From the founding throughout American history, generations of Americans came, generations came here to America, leaving aristocracies and monarchies to come to a republic. The idea of an aristocracy wasn't something from Aristotle or the ancient world. It was alive and well in Europe at the time, in the 19th century. There were lords. This was a normal thing. It, it, was, it existed and it was a real threat. It was real to them. After World War II, the divide becomes capitalism against communism. Big shift. And fears of communism cut against discussions of equity and egalitarian policies in this period. The third change is that we enter an era of great prosperity. Economists call this the Great Compression. GDP was up, median incomes are up, the American middle class is growing larger and larger. Part of the reason this happened is that as a country, we undertook policies to make it happen. Uh, during the Great Depression, we regulated finance through the Securities and Exchange Commission. We created the Glass-Steagall Act, which divided different kinds of banking. Uh, we also invested in people to try to build a middle class. We expanded home ownership. We sent a generation to school through the GI Bill. We invested in infrastructure, which helped create jobs, but also created growth. And we also did things to lift people out of poverty during this period, Medicare, Medicaid, Head Start, a variety of programs largely associated with Johnson's Great Society. So in this post-war period, the period from 1947 or so through uh, the 1970s, beginning of the 70s, economic inequality was just less of an issue. 
Now, some of you have been probably thinking uh, from the start uh, that this can't possibly be right. What about women? What about African Americans? How can this story possibly coexist with the reality of extreme inequality among these groups? Now, in the book, I distinguish between two traditions. The first, which is the story that I've told you so far, I call the middle class constitutional tradition. And the idea here is that to have a republic, you have to have relative economic equality within the political community. But this tradition leaves open a really important question. Who's in the political community? Now, this question has been fiercely contested and battled over our history. But over time, what we can see is a tradition of inclusion that has expanded the political community to include women and minorities uh, as part of, as full members in our political community. Now, the key thing, I think, is, that, is what happens when these two traditions intersect. When you expand the political community, it now becomes necessary for all the new members of the political community to be able to join the middle class, or else the underlying theory of the republic doesn't work. And throughout our history, statesmen actually understood this. After the Civil War, for example, the Reconstruction Republicans fought not just for emancipation and political rights, but for 40 acres and a mule, which was an idea of economic possibility. So Thaddeus Stevens was a, a Pennsylvania congressman, uh, and, and he proposed that we should, uh, that the United States should confiscate the wealth and the land of the top 10% of planters in the South, rebel planters. And that should be redistributed to the freed slaves uh, so that each could get 40 acres and thereby be independent property owners, have a measure of economic possibility, wealth themselves. Uh, and then here's how, here's how he justified this. He said, without this, without this proposal, this government can never be as it has never been a true republic. Heretofore, it had more the features of aristocracy than of democracy. The southern states have been despotisms, not governments of the people. It is impossible that any practical equality of rights can exist where a few thousand men monopolize the whole landed property. The larger the number of small proprietors, the more safe and stable the government. After he died a few years later in 1868, uh, one of his colleagues summed up Stevens's views this way. He said, he knew that a landed aristocracy and a landless class are alike dangerous in a republic. And by a single act of justice, he would abolish both. So the Reconstruction Republicans understood this, but it wasn't just them. The civil rights reformers of the 60s understood this as well. We often forget that when Martin Luther King Jr. gave his I Have a Dream speech uh, at the March on Washington, the title of the march was the March for Jobs and Freedom, not just politics, but also economic. And look, the, the, the interplay of these traditions is not always neat. Um, the Reconstruction Republicans fought for equality for African Americans, uh, but not for women. The Jacksonians fought for economic opportunity, but were not racially inclusive. The Civil Rights Movement moved toward equality on race, gender, and economics all at once. So there's a wide range in how these themes have intersected in our history. But I think the key thing is that if we care about our republic and the foundations of it, we have to understand that as the political community expands, we have to have economic equality for everyone within it. The problem today is that we're once again in an era of economic inequality. And I think this, as a result, is a threat to our basic constitutional structure, a threat to our republic. So what can we do about this? Um, well, looking at the long history of republics, I think we have two options. The first option is that we can abandon the project of being a middle class nation. We can align our economics and our politics along economic inequality. We can just embrace the fact that we're now an unequal society, forget our constitution, let's adapt to that. What would that mean? What that would mean is we might create a tribune of the plebs. Uh, it might mean that we should have a wealth cap on becoming a member of the House of Representatives. Majority of the people in the House of Representatives are millionaires. We could say, to get in the house, you can't have a net worth of more than $50,000. No. We could put a wealth cap, we could put a wealth minimum on becoming a senator. Property qualifications for being a senator. That's the kind of thing that it takes if you're going to embrace economic inequality. 
Now, I think these solutions are pretty outlandish. I think they're undesirable. I think they're probably not workable either, unlikely to be passed. Um, but that's one option. Uh, so if we reject that option, the second option is that we have to rebuild the middle class. We have to reshape our economy, and we have to make our politics more democratic. And there's a lot of things we could talk about here. We could talk about raising the minimum wage, organizing working class people through unions and political movements. We talk about political reforms to voting. We talk about campaign finance reform. But the bottom line is that we have to do these things not to increase economic growth, not for moral reasons, um, although we could do them for those reasons. We have to do them, though, if we want to preserve our constitutional system, if we want to save our republic. And here's the thing. The founders understood this. They knew they were building a constitution based on a set of economic assumptions. And they knew that someday conditions would change. James Madison, father of the Constitution, in 1788, uh, looks forward and thinks that America may have 25 years before inequality starts becoming a problem for the new nation. As the country moves west, he revises his estimates. And by 1829, he thinks it will be 100 years before the population will change, will be much higher, before land will no longer be available and when, as he says, the proportion being without property would increase. And what Madison said was at that time, when that happened, the institutions and laws of the country must be adapted, and it will require for the task all the wisdom of the wisest patriots. So today, I think we're in a place where what we need are wise patriots who will recognize that we have to reshape our economy, we have to make our country more democratic, and we have to do this in order to fulfill and preserve our constitutional system. Thanks. So uh, I'll take questions for a while from people. Um, and uh, happy to, if you want to raise their hand. Yeah. Uh, just a basic question. Now, given what you said about the founder's understanding of economic inequality, what was their justification for the uh, property ownership requirement for voting? It's a great question. So the question, uh, just, just for people who couldn't hear it, is what about property uh, requirements on voting? And I think one of the most interesting things, um, first, just so we get our facts out first, is what's surprising about the revolutionary period is how little the property requirements are for voting, not how much they are. And what happens in the course of the revolution is that most states actually massively reduce the amount of requirements that they have on property ownership for voting, such that in most places, 90% or more of white men uh, can vote. Uh, in some places, this is actually uh, expanded, and voting is expanded uh, in, in Pennsylvania. African Americans can vote in New Jersey. Women can vote. So there's some there's some interesting uh, dynamics going on at the time. But the revolution unleashes these hugely democratic tendencies, uh, and pop and property requirements drop precipitously to extremely low levels. Um, in most places, not everywhere, but in most places. Uh, the second thing is, so how did they justify even these requirements? So what's odd, uh, maybe the most odd thing about this period is that they justify a lot of these requirements not in order to protect the wealthy's ability to govern, but in order to prevent the wealthy from capturing the people and gaining power. So their fear is that if you don't have economic independence, if you don't have enough wealth, someone will just pay you for their vote, for your vote. So they're very worried about bribery, they're very worried about corruption, and the thought is if you're economically independent, then some rich person can't come and just pay you for your vote. And so it's a protection against that kind of design is partly how they justify it at the time. So uh, it's a totally different world in some ways than how we think about it today, uh, but in, in a lot of their comments, that's how, that's how it comes out. I'm a law professor, so I'm going to start calling on you if you don't uh, <laughs> pipe up. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Lexman. Um, a very compelling argument. And the fact that even through history, you talked about how in the 19th century in Europe, there were already this concept of oligarchy and that the meat cake was existing long before our republic was founded. And then you mentioned very nicely about the fact that we actually had somewhat of a um, um, uh, less inequality um, uh, post-World War up to the 70s. And then Reagan came in and made this America great again. 
Um, and we've had now, again, a rise in inequality. I feel like Bill Murray, am I wrong? I feel like it's Groundhog Day. I mean, we're going to have this over and over. It's going to be like the tides go out and the tides come back in periodically. Um, and that's just the way it is. Well, I mean, well, it seems human. It seems natural. So, so this is a futile exercise, is my question. So there's so it's, it's a good question. So so there, there's you know it's interesting in 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 American history there have been uh, many historians, um, uh, well at least a few prominent historians. The most famous ones uh, are Arthur Schlesinger Sr., Arthur Schlesinger Jr. Uh, famous historian Arthur Schlesinger Jr. Uh, was here at Harvard for for a while. Also um, worked for President Kennedy. Uh, in the White House, uh, and and they talked a lot about the cycles of American history. That there were these kind of patterns that recurred uh, between times of public purpose and times of private action, uh, and that you could see uh, ebbs and flows. Uh, they either call it the tides of American politics going in and out, or the cycles turning. So there was there's been some arguments about that, and you could imagine there being turns. You go through. Uh, big conservative periods, then big liberal periods, and, and back and forth. And within that, maybe there's smaller periods, too, where we oscillate between the two. Um, there have been other historians, uh, Henry Adams, um, another one who is uh, here at Harvard as well, uh, and a historian in, in the 19th century, a great-grandson of John Adams, grandson of John Quincy Adams. Uh, and he flirted with the idea of history as a pendulum oscillating back and forth, but deeply worried that actually history was just accelerating faster and faster and eventually would go smash because of all the forces that we people had unleashed starting with industrialization that we were not going to be able to control. And so he found solace in going back to the Middle Ages and to religion because that was the only place he could escape to to, to see, um, to, to, to worry about the future. Uh, so we've had different ways of thinking about it throughout our history. Um, in, in the ancient world, they always think about cycles and the cycles of republics. So, you know, oligarchies, tyrannies, uh, uh, mob rule, these are things that you cycle through over time. Aristocracies, monarchies, uh, and democracies. You cycle through these different forms of government. Um, and the answer, the question, the reason why the class warfare constitution was so important was it was supposed to protect you from these cycles. The idea is that in an aristocracy, the aristocracy becomes corrupt, it becomes an oligarchy, just run by the rich. And then you would have an overthrow of the oligarchy. You'd end up with some sort of democracy. But then that would be a problem. You'd end up with mob rule of some kind. So it, this was a huge problem. The idea in ancient Rome, for example, of having the Senate and the Tribune of the Plebs is by these two bodies checking each other, you avoided this whole mess. You built both of them right in. And so you could break through the problem of these cyclical problems of class conflict. So. You know, are we going back, are we in a cyclical era? Maybe, I mean, this is, we have a lot of things similar to the Gilded Age, the reason why people call this the New Gilded Age. Um, there's an element of this that seems similar. Uh, but the question on whether this is futile is, you know, you have to do something about it if you wanna, if you wanna change it. And if it is a cycle, cycles don't just happen naturally, people actually make them happen in each direction. Uh, and if it's not a cycle, all the more reason to, you know, to, to, to switch um, politics completely in a way uh, to you know to stand athwart history yelling stop and try to actually fight back against against these kind of trends. I, I mean, as, as, a, as a quick supplementary to that, I mean, it seems like some societies in Europe are immune to the cyclical nature. They seem to have adapted a certain um, <coughs> true democracy, the Scandinavian countries, for example. So, to support your argument, even as I argue with you that there seem to be maybe the only thing there about is as someone with uh, some works in genomics and genetics, they are somewhat hum kind of smaller countries, people of fairly homogeneous small cultures, so maybe they're less prone to, they're almost like petri dishes of culture, if you will. So they are isolated in some sense, but in larger societies, maybe we are in some sense condemned to cycle and all stuff. So, so I'll say one thing about that. So throughout history, in the history of republics, there's, there was a theory. And the theory was that to have a republic, you had to have a small society, it was small republics. It's called the small republic thesis. That's how people think of it. And the real challenge with America was we had a really large country. And so there was a big question. Can you actually have a republic in a large country? And James Madison is the one who came up with a theory to explain why it would be possible to have a large republic in America. 
why would we have to have a large republic at all? And what he says in the Federalist Number 10 is he says, the reason why you can have a large republic is in a large republic there'll be so many little factions, so many little fragmentations, that they'll never coalesce into two big groups like rich and poor. And so all these little factions will sort of cancel each other out. Maybe you win today, I win tomorrow, somebody else wins the next day. There's no repeat, there's no polarization in a deep sense. Um, and so as a result, we don't have to be worried about this. These things will all cancel each other out. And what will happen is people who support the public good and are virtuous leaders, they'll be the ones who get elected, not people from one faction or the other. The only ones who'll be able to make it through will be public spirited. And they'll be the ones who get to, to, to govern. So that's the theory of, of the extended republic. Now what's important about this is that this rests on the absence of economic inequality because Madison himself even says in Federalist 10, the most common divide in all societies is rich and poor. He concedes it. But then he just goes on to say, that's not the divide that we're going to have here. Uh, and the reason for this, I posit in the book, and, 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 and other historians have occasionally uh, suggested as well, is that it was relying on this idea that we actually didn't have these big divides. And if you don't have these big divides, everything looks like a small, a small difference. So his factions are, there will be mechanics and also uh, you know, uh, commerce, uh, people who pursue commerce, and there will also be um, uh, farmers, and there will be uh, carpenters. Mm -hmm. And so somehow the carpenters are a different faction from the mechanics who are different from, and so it's not rich and poor in his, in his estimation. So it's a very different kind of a scheme. So I think that's how he thinks of it, but it relies on this idea underlying. There's a question over here, yes. Yeah. So thinking about the Gilded Age and Tammany Hall, to what extent is economic inequality a threat because of corruption rather than just because of the, the divide that it creates between rich and poor? So I think the mechanism, the one question is how, how does this work? What's the mechanism by which this works? So the idea here um, th th that I present, I think there's probably multiple ways we could think about this, but the core one that people through history are thinking about is that what happens is when you have these big divides between rich and poor, instead of having a large middle class, people start thinking that they're different from each other. Um, so you're rich, you think, I have more virtue, I'm smarter, I'm better, I deserve what I have, and I'm more worthy of governing. And then you start to govern. You try to get more active in governing, you take over the government in different ways, you run for office, you support candidates, you push your views. Uh, but the problem is that wealthy people have very different views than everybody else about what's good for society. They often want things that are good for themselves, and what's good for them may not be good for the common good. And so as the wealthy start pushing policies that support their own interests, economic interests, against the common interests, uh, you end up with a system that makes them more wealthy. Well, as they get more wealthy, they think they're more able to govern and that they should govern and they try to govern more and they influence politics in a bunch of ways, campaign spending and lobbying and so on. Uh, and this creates this vicious cycle. One commentator has called it the doom loop of oligarchy where basically you rewrite the rules in order to make yourself more wealthy, that makes you more wealthy, that makes you better able to rewrite the rules, which again makes you more wealthy. So that's the cycle of, of that, that's the thing people are worried about. And then the concern then is once you get into that oligarchy, uh, and you could call that a form of corruption, right? It's a corruption of what we think of as pursuing the public good. Um, once you get into that oligarchy, you now no longer have a republic. And this is why when John Taylor says, when the rich plunder the poor, it's slow and legal, the point of it is there's not, you don't change the constitution to say, you know, we the oligarchs decide that we're now an oligarchy, we're not gonna be a democracy anymore. That doesn't happen. It just happens quietly, you never notice, and one day you wake up and you're in a different kind of government. So that's, that's sort of how it works. But you could call that a kind of corruption. Yeah, there was a hand somewhere back. Yes? I, I was just wondering if you could expand <coughs> a little bit on what you view as the, the solutions to the problem. I mean, you sort of mm -hmm. briefly touched on it labor unions or what have you, but if you could spend more time on that. Yeah, great. So, um, so I think there's different categories of solutions, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll put aside the bucket of things that are in the class warfare constitutional right. tradition, the tribune of the plebs and all of that. I think those are, you can read about them, I talk about them in the book. They're pretty interesting, actually, um, but they're a little, uh, a little out there. Some of them that would be less out there, I'll just say a brief word about that. Something like um, an ombudsman. Right? The idea of an ombudsman or a public advocate is effectively a kind of a tribune of the plebs. It's somebody who's supposed to be standing for all of the people and their interests against 
whatever government agencies, private corporations and, and being an advocate for them. That's the idea of the public advocate. Lots of states have public advocates and ombudsmen and the origins of those are originally in the Tribune of the Plebs. So there's some modern versions that are not outlandish. Um, in terms of what can we actually do that seems more, uh, more, more pragmatic, I, I think there's really a couple of categories. The first categories are reforms to our economic system. Um, and here we can divide between two big buckets. One are things that we think of as ways to redistribute wealth, which is what people talk about now. So the obvious things there, people think about taxing and spending, right? And you can tax people, you could create benefits. So uh, healthcare is a benefit paid for in some cases by taxes. Um, so that's one version, redistributing wealth. And that could also be transfer payments and so on. Uh, a second way we can think about this is what some scholars have called pre-distribution rather than redistribution. But the idea here is we should reshape the economy so that the distribution of wealth that the economy actually generates is more equal to start with. So then you don't actually have to do the redistribution on the back end because it, the outcomes came out right the first time. And so what does that look like? Uh, the biggest policy area here that people um, used to think about a lot more than they do today is antitrust and public utilities regulation. And these are things to deal with massive consolidation and corporate power. And the reason why I think about these is because uh, first, corporations concentrate wealth in owners, shareholders, uh, and managers uh, against the workers who work in them, who often will get paid just a salary. Right? So the, disproportionately, the gains of the corporation are not going to the workers. Uh, and so that's one reason why in the progressive era and even today people are concerned about, about corporate consolidation. The second thing is they can raise prices. Right? So consumers actually get worse, worse quality product um, uh, when this happens because there's no competition. So when there's no competition, you can jack up the price. Uh, if you fly on airlines, you understand how that works. Um, a, a, third, a, a third problem is that consolidated power has more political influence. So if you're really powerful in an industry, you can lobby a lot. In the, the financial insurance and real estate industries uh, of the economy uh, had uh, I think the number, uh, if I remember right, is, is uh, 1,400 lobbyists in Washington in, 20, um, in 2014, uh, which is something like, you know, it's, it's, it's four times, it actually it's more than that, because it's, it's more than four times, four lobbyists for every member of Congress. So it's got to be over 2,000, over 2,000, four times for every member of Congress. Um, you can hire all those lobbyists when you have a lot of money and when you're a highly consolidated industry. Uh, so you're worried about the political influence that these organizations have. And so what the progressives did is they came up with antitrust as a way to address one half of this. They're going to try to break up big corporations in order to have smaller ones. You have small businesses, you have medium-sized companies. And what that means is that, the, is that more people can participate in ownership and more people can, be, uh, can gain, gain from that. Um, they also came up with public utility regulation, which said if something is a real monopoly, that's fine. Let's make it a monopoly. But then let's regulate it and let's regulate the rates. And so electric companies, for example, are an example of a, a monopoly like this, a monopoly kind of service that's regulated as a public utility. And so those things were invented in the progressive era as trying to get at exactly these kind of problems uh, of both the distribution of wealth, but also the structure of the economy as a whole. And those things have been in, uh, in disuse, I think, for many, many years, but now are starting to have a little bit more of a resurgence. People are interested now, again, in a more aggressive antitrust uh, structure, interested in what public utilities regulation might have to say about companies today. And back over here. Um, what about the nation state itself? Um, is, is, is sometimes I think the nation state is sort of played out. We're in this global world where everybody is trading everywhere. So it, it, the nation state is a relatively recent phenomenon, really. Uh, it's only a few hundred years old. So are we, I mean, and if we're at the end of the nation state, then these solutions that come within the state, they, they don't work as well because you can export you know, cheap labor jobs somewhere else or you, know, you, you, can, you, can, you can wheel your way around these laws that you put up in, in the nation because this is other bigger playing field. So you're almost at the point where Marx you know, said, well, the only revolution will be this worldwide revolution and not just in a little nation state. Could you address that? So I, I, I think, so, so the question is about the nation state. Where is it going? How should we think about that? So I, I think that, uh, I don't think that we're at the end of the nation state. I think one reason why we're not is we see politics at a local level being hugely important for people. 
Uh, and in some cases, we actually see maybe the destruction of the nation state, but not from above, from global community, but from below, from people wanting more rooted community. So the idea that maybe Scotland will leave England, the idea of Brexit are partly about rooted community, not global community. So in a sense, I mean, that may still be a pushing of the nation state, but it's, it's into a direction of politics and community. Um, the second place is, I think what we see in a lot of places, is people wanting to exercise political power through their state. Uh, you could think about elections in, um, in, in recent years, the kind of populist movements uh, across the West as, as an example of, of that phenomenon. Um, but I think you're right that we can't address this fully just by looking at domestic issues. We also have to look at the economic piece of it and uh, the international piece of it. Um, and the place where this comes up most frequently, I think, these days is in thinking about the structure of how trade is, is set up. Uh, and anybody, I think, looking at last year's election uh, you know, has a sense that there's a lot of people, both on the left in the Bernie Sanders camp and on the right in the Donald Trump camp, who are very, very upset about a history of trade uh, that they didn't think was working for working people here, a history of how globalization has moved over the years. So I think you can't get around these questions without thinking seriously about the international economic piece, both on the trade side and in terms of things like tax policy, tax havens, worldwide tax ha how, how um, cross-jurisdictional, cross-country taxation works. So that's going to be a huge part of the story going forward. That's a big part of the, the component. Yeah. Yes, in the front. It seems like politics and the political system is increasingly tied to market cycles. And so we see these big periods like the New Deal and the period we're experiencing now of volatility as being closely linked to we just had two crashes, the Great Recession and the Great Depression, respectively. And so it seems like as politics is increasingly tied to market cycles, it seems like you might have to rebuild the system every time enough market cycles have caused the political system to crash. Is there any way we can build the market so that it builds a middle class and then we don't need to reinvent the system? So it's a great question. I like planted this question. I didn't, I didn't plant the question, but I could have. It's a great question. So here's, so here's what happened. Throughout our history, we actually had a series of boom and bust crashes uh, and cycles, exactly as you described, basically from the beginning of the country through until the Great Depression. Almost every 20 years, there's a big crash. 1798 or so, uh, 1819, 1837, 1857, 1873, uh, 1893, 1907, 1929, right? There's crashes every single one of those times. Panic, big crash. After the Great Depression, we don't see another big crash till 2008. In fact, there's not uh, the number of banks that fail uh, post the reforms of post World War II. Uh, it never goes greater than single digits uh, for the next almost half century until I think it's the 80s. Um, you don't see more than single digits. Uh, and so, what happened? Well, what happened is we put in a bunch of reforms to try to structure the financial industry to prevent this boom and bust cycle from continuing as it had continued from basically the beginning of the republic onward. And there were a bunch of things that were a part of that. So the Federal Reserve was created by the progressives in the progressive era, but gets reformed repeatedly, and the Federal Reserve is one component of this structure. The Securities and Exchange Commission is another component. Uh, the uh, Glass-Steagall separating depository institutions from investment banking, and then later it gets expanded to, uh, to separate in, uh, insurance. And there's a lot of misunderstandings about, about Glass-Steagall, but the basic concept of it is different kinds of functions in finance should be separate from each other so that they don't influence each other. That's the basic idea. Um, so those are, those are some of what we do. We have tax policies also and other things at the time that, that shape this. But the idea here is we shape the market. Uh, and, and for anyone who's skeptical of this, every market is shaped. It's shaped by laws. And the reason why we know this is because markets rely on contract and property to operate. Contract and property only exists when there is a government that enforces contracts and property rights. Uh, so this is created and contract law is a body of law. It's made by people. Uh, and people can make it however they want to make it. Um, and there's variations that you can imagine in, in how the law is structured. So we can choose how these rules are set up. Um, antitrust was also a big part of this story, as I was talking about before. It was a robust antitrust regime that existed in the early part of the, the 20th century. Um, so we did do exactly this for a while. And then we started undoing it in the last half century. And so a wide variety of these financial regulatory uh, uh, pieces that were put in place got unwound 
over time, some by regulators, sometimes by Congress, uh, and then we ended up with the big crash. Um, so I think we, you know, what's, what's heartening about that story is that we can go back and rewrite the rules in a way that will prevent us from going back to this cycle of, of boom and bust again. I think we have time for maybe one more. So in the back. Um, so we've talked a lot about um, income inequality as being one of the root causes of some of the issues around popularism. The complication I've, I've brought, and I'd be curious to your thought about it, is that if you look at sort of a global trend of populism, that global trend is partially related to income inequality, but it's partially also related to other factors and divisions. And, to case in point, the, the country of our, our ethnicity is the, the largest state is now ruled by a firebrand anti-Muslim monk. So those trends seem in some ways to be not just related to, to economics, but there is this rise of fundamentalism broadly, whether you talk India, whether you talk France in a few months, whether you talk Holland, so on and so forth. Um, so to what degree is that movement or that rise complicate the story a little bit, which is, are there other factors that are going on that are driving something that is perhaps even more fundamental or problematic? So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, so the question is about how do we think about other factors? So um, religion, race, uh, um, other kinds of things that seem to be driving some of the populist movements in addition to economic considerations that also seem to be driving some of these populist movements globally. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm not going to, I don't have an answer for you that would um, pull out one or the other as the causal mechanism. I don't, that's, uh, as a law professor, I'm ill-suited to making those kinds of causal determinations. I'm sure there's somebody in a economics department or political science department who, who treads in that kind of thing. But, um, but what I do think is that there is, there's certainly both going on. Um, but they interact in complicated ways, right? You can imagine each of these things independently. You can imagine economic populism without racism. In fact, in our history, there have actually been uh, movements that tried to unite people based on uh, economics across races. So in the populist era uh, in the 1890s, um, there was a movement in Georgia to create a biracial coalition, blacks and whites, uh, of working class people against the elites. Uh, and the leaders of this movement said that the purpose was because the elites were deliberately using race in order to try to break the coalition of people so that they could perpetuate their power. Because they knew that if there was not racism, if there was a union across races of people who were um, economically more disadvantaged, that they would not be able to continue to hold political power. Um, so there have been places where, where that's existed, I think, over time. Uh, and cut in, in a slightly different direction. Um, but then you have the exact opposite of that, where people use economics uh, and race together through dog whistle politics, through uh, other things to try to, um, or sorry, to try use race to try to inflame other kinds of economic insecurities. So you can blame someone for your economic problems who is different from you. Uh, whether or not that may be the cause of the actual economic problems, there's the opportunity for someone uh, the, the kind of bad opportunity for someone in politics to, to, to use that as an excuse. So I think you see both kinds of things happening in different times and at different places. Uh, and so my hope in some ways is that we would move to a place where we think um, not about dividing and blaming, but about joining and working together to try to reform our, our political and economic system, uh, because that is what's required to actually fulfill uh, this tradition that we're part of. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, what, uh, we got Trump because we're not good enough citizens. And uh, we've just got to be better citizens.